Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, welcome to the Mills at Rogers Museum. My name is Michelle Lantieri. I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions here. And I first would like to honor the Tiwa speaking peoples on whose land we are. We're really excited to present the third discussion in our curated conversation series for this current exhibition. And it's Southwest Reflections in Between Shadows of the Land. So as the second installment of the Millicent Rogers Museum's New Mexico Artist Series, Southwest Reflections in Between Shadows of the Land offers a diverse exploration of nine New Mexico artist portrayals of environmental relationships and the ways that these events become conveyed through shadows, reflections, and movements. The featured artists in the exhibition are Matthew and Julie Chase Daniel, Dora Dillstone, who's at the end of the table here. Welcome, Dora. Thank you. Juanita J. Lavadi is sitting next to me. Welcome, Juanita. Thank you. Lorraine Gala Lewis, Paula Lopez, Colette Marie, Brandon Adriano Ortiz, and Will Wilson. And I'd also like to thank the following organizations for their generous support New Mexico Arts, the Taos Community Foundation, and also Los Alamos National Laboratory Foundation. So today's curated conversations topic is called Locational Memories, Reflecting Time and Place in Art. And I'm so honored to be here today in dialogue with Dora Dillstone and Juanita J. Labadee. Thanks to both of you for joining us today. So it's my pleasure to introduce these artists to you. Based in Taos, Dora Dillstone came into adulthood in the 1960s instilled with the need for constant questioning and change. The political climate of the 1970s helped shape her philosophical approach to life and art. She spent time living and painting in the New Mexico mountains, which had a great impact on her sense of space and light. She studied at the University of Houston and the Museum of Fine Art Houston's Glassell School of Art. She worked and learned in the Tao studio of Larry Bell and later under the guidance of Christian Eckert both of which opened up new directions in her work. She began studying Chinese ink and brushwork to return to spontaneous yet controlled imagery that would blend the Eastern materials with Western thought and application. Emergence and submergence, light and space, mortality and immortality remain the underlying themes of her art. And Juanita Lavadi is a Tausenia with ancestral inspiration and skills in the following areas of practice. Fiber artist, graphic artist, oral historian, exhibit presenter, and licensed bilingual classroom teacher. Wow. <laughs> she studied graphics and fiber arts with community mentors at New Mexico Highlands University. She's motivated by family stories, community history, role models, traditional hand skills, and by capable mentors and teachers through a lifetime of community collaboration. A retired public school teacher, oral historian, and graphic and fiber artist, Lavadi's creative and cultural interests are deeply rooted in relation to the Ezequia system that supports the land, water, and inhabitants of northern New Mexico in general, and the traditional Hispano and indigenous cultures. Oral history publications include Four Generations of Weaving and Taos, a Topical History Anthology. The textiles are in permanent museum collections, including here at the Millicent Rogers Museum. So welcome to you both. So today we're going to switch the format up a little bit. Um, I had shared some questions with the artists for all of us to be prepared for this conversation. Um, and they came back with some really great images that you guys are going to see. And so we're going to learn a lot about the context of both of these artists' works through um, some imagery that we're going to be showing here. Um, so just to kind of preface what you all are going to see, here are some of the questions that inspired the images and artworks that Dora and Juanita are going to show us. So some of these questions are, how long have you been making art? Can you tell us a bit about your background as an artist? What are the main influences of your art practice? And can you talk about the guiding forces of your medium, designs, and palettes? So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Juanita. And thank you so much. I look forward to hearing from you both. Turns on. 
just want to avoid the squeegee. The squeegee. <laughs> my apologies. Um, it is a blustery day, and uh, my voice is reacting to that. So uh, I will try to be as clear as I can. Uh, bear with me. Thank you. So um, I'll take my cue from you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So starting with um, this slide, um, and Karen, if you could advance to the next slide, um, starting with the, the next image here, um, this is a really recent exhibition that you worked on um, just down the road in Albuquerque at 516 Arts, and you were really lucky to be able to show um, some of the same work, but in you know a slightly different theme uh, with this exhibition with Southwest Reflections. Um, can you tell us what we're looking at here and, and some background about the work? This is an installation that is titled Ciboleros y Comancheros. <clears throat> and it's um, based on uh, my experiences as we weaver and also in oral history. But it's an installation which also reflects my experience as a classroom teacher. Because uh, I special, I am a bilingual teacher, but I have to say that a good part of my teaching in the classroom is what I call visual literacy. And that implies what you see, but also multi-sensory. So in this particular case, I, I uh, created a, an installation with um, hands constructed carreta, that's the cart that you see in the background. <clears throat> There's a quasi-historical map on the uh, foreground, and then the four shirts, two of which are in this particular exhibit. And each shirt has a book, reflecting also with literacy. My children always, always make books, my students. But um, each one re represents the historical aspect behind each shirt that was constructed and um, a futuristic dream, which back in the 1700s and the 1800s would be a dream that relates to contemporary issues. So it would be futuristic and at that time probably, if you think of that time, surrealistic. Oh, I have to say, each shirt represents an imagined persona mm -hmm. based on historical research. So um, it was great. I had a lot of, uh, in, um, well, from the, the slides that you can see, there was a lot of uh, interaction with, with the installation, which is what I wanted, hands on, people could touch. And even the, the shirts that are on exhibit here, um, I know Michelle asked, well, should I put a note, do not touch? Well, these shirts are intended to be worn. Sure, you can touch them. And that's part of it, <laughs> part of the sensory. Um, great, thank you so much for that. I know, and I appreciate that that's um, one of a handful of works in, in the show that are, you know, you can touch the texture and, and really get to know the material in that way too, like a multi sensory approach. Um, can we go to the next slide? And um, so here's an example of one of the pairings of one of your shirts and uh, one of the books. Uh, would you like to speak about this one a little bit? Mm. Yeah, um, part of the history of, of the, the Comancheros, it was, it was, these were merchants, very grassroots merchants representing the community who contributed goods, those of Maiz, that would be taken on these carts across <clears throat> the plains east of the mountains and into the Llano Estacado, where there would be interaction, uh, commercial interaction with the tribes there. And so this particular shirt is made of trade cloth, meaning that it was woven here, but that it was um, part of the commodities that came over either from the from Europe or from uh, the Orient through the Manila galleons. And um, well, that's a copy of the book on the side, and you can see a lowrider car, and that indicates that the dream that this particular wearer had. Um, he was riding a lower lowrider car, whatever he may have called it. Um, partly inspired also by um, um, a, um, right off the bat, I can't remember his name, um, is an Argentinian writer, Julio Cortaza, who uh, utilized flashbacks and dreams. And uh, this was partly inspired by his story of a uh, young man riding a motorcycle who was in an accident and on the operation table, he had flashbacks of being an Aztec warrior on the sacrificial pyramid. And the doctors come in to operate with, with the scalpel. So these kind of flashbacks going back and forth that have a connection with contemporary times. This is what I wanted to do with the dreams. So in this dream, um, the book is here in the museum. 
and uh, it's got the shirt has embellishments it's a really beautiful Italian wool, summer weight wool, so it's almost like cotton. It's very lightweight, very, very, very fluid, nice handle. Um, there's um, some antique Navajo buttons on it and a brooch onyx, uh, green onyx. Um, but the embellishments are part of also the story. This man was a consummate storyteller and uh, showman. So as a seller, this is one of the commodities that you would have to sell. Very nice shirt, very nice presenter, and he wanted to do business, talk to his two wives. Um, <laughs> but this kind of imaginary persona that would be part of uh, the shirt, what the shirt represents. Great, thank you so much. Oh, um, yeah, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Okay, the next one. Yeah, this particular shirt is side of the two bags of wool. I pulled, I spun more than a mile of yarn to create the shirt. But this shirt was with the idea that uh, it, it represents the Herba Cuadrado, the block print, which is also known as the Buffalo plan. And so this particular shirt is what instigated this whole installation because uh, the Buffalo plaids, people may argue, this, you know, where does the Buffalo plaid come from? Well, it comes from here. It comes from the Herba Cuadrado block, the quadrato, the quadrato quadrilateral block of the plan. And these, this particular cloth was hand woven, usually to make um, back bags for the uh, trade routes or for rugs on the floor for the church and definitely wool uh, the work shirts. So this particular shirt is a work shirt. You can work, you don't have to roll up your sleeves because it's three quarters, uh, three quarter length sleeves. I did a lot of research and I had a wonderful time meeting with mountain men uh, who have logged hours and hours and hours on back, on back for all the different rendezvous that they may attended during their lifetime. But uh, again, this particular uh, persona is a young man who was going out for his first time on a buffalo hunt <clears throat> and the family worked together. Uh, traditionally, back in those days, the yarn that was used in something like this would have been everyone who contributed. Even children were learning how to spin. Uh, I wish I'd had that because it took me a long time to spin all of the yarn for this. <laughs> but um, it represents communal work, you know, communal contributions, especially for a young man who's going out for the first time. In this case, he's uh, been trained as a lancero to hunt buffalo with a lance. So um, sometimes they didn't always come back. I mean, it's just fraught with um, dangers on the road, dangers with intertribal interactions, and dangers from riding in a horse in the middle of a st stampede. So um, that's what this shirt represents. And the story's in there too. His dream has to do with a real strange monster on these two lines coming across the floor of Vienna, which was basically the railroad and witnessing in his dreams the railroad slaughters that the um, the buffalo slaughters that the uh, railroad promoted as a hunting experience. <coughs> um, and then can we go to the next slide too? Um, and so here we can see some of your weaving process um, with the shirt. I'm really glad that you provided this image just to, to get a sense of how, how it goes from the yarns um, to the shirt. Um, would you like to speak about this part of the process? <clears throat> Match our on and off here so we don't give the screech to anybody. <laughs> um, yeah, this was, um, well, basically, I think I covered most of it. What you see on the weaving, it didn't take me long to weave. It really was a process of spinning the yarn. But um, it's one of those things about uh, artists dealing with uh, taxation and uh, sales and taxes. Uh, this piece started with two bags of yarn black yarn and white yarn. <clears throat> and the hours that it took to actually produce this uh, is not comparable to the cost of the materials is which I can take tax deductions on. <laughs> and that's a bag of black wool and a bag of white raw wool. But uh, this exemplifies the hours that went into it. It was a pleasure though, because this is something that I've been wanting to do to tie in this part of history with a popular shirt, the Cholo shirt that's popular with, uh, well, it's, generally popular all over the United States with that buffalo plaid, flannel, nice warm wool shirt you see mm -hmm. people wearing with like what we have outside today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. And then um, go to, uh, yeah, we've got, actually, I think there was one slide before. There we go. Um, and so you also provided this woodcut uh, to speak to the inspiration for your um, Cuatro Elementos paintings that we have here in the exhibition. Um, can you talk about the pathway, making the, the woodcut, and then making the leap to the paintings? The woodcut was actually done in Oaxaca. Um, I just was together with uh, some artists, and we had one wood. Each one of us had one wood. So this was the image that I created. It was the idea of breath. Um, but this actually was part of the inspiration for the collection that you see on the wall. What I wanted to do with the four elements was to create a visceral sense while I was working on the canvas, but also I would like to have uh, evoke a visceral sense from the viewer of what the elements are. So the fire <clears throat> was the first piece and it just literally exploded on, on the canvas. I had that done in one day. I mean, it's just, you know, the energy that we created was very um, exuberant for me. Um, and the one that I struggled with was the earth. And uh, that one just, uh, it just kept changing. It just kept changing with me. And I, I uh, was kind of trying to go with the flow and this is what I ended up with. And somebody says, is that a Valentine to the earth? <laughs> that was not an intended visual, it just kind of came up. But um, working with the water, that was also like the fire. It, it kind of flowed, nice flow, but it took take more than one day to actually <clears throat> get the essence. For me, when I was satisfied with what I call the visceral, visceral essence. But um, the, this particular piece is in relationship to the element of air. And in Spanish, when you talk about the cuatro elementos, air would be aliento. But aliento is also another word for breath. And for relationship of breath, especially with the native, native cultures, um, when you pray, you also breathe on your prayer because that's a part of the contribution of the prayer. So in a sense, it's air, aliento, breath, prayer, and uh, it's in uh, the four elements. And the reason I included this particular image of the woodcut because that face is also in the painting. It's very, it's hidden, but it's in there. So if you look at it, it's the air and uh, blowing on your hands with a prayer is also a way that you extend your, your um, the spiritual connection out there with your prayer. So um, I just brought that in because I don't know how many people may actually see that image in the air canvas, the Aliento canvas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think it's really interesting to, um, to look across media like this, um, you know, especially like the process of making a woodcut with, you know, some elements of carving and the attention to detail that you're doing, um, and then to interpret it into paint kind of much more with a, like a flow and moving around the, the medium in that way. Um, so I think, I think it's really important to see those together. Um, and then we have one more slide for you. Um, it's your salmon rock paintings. Um, would you like to tell us about how these came about? <clears throat> Again, this is one. This one actually stems from my uh, the training that I've had with murals and with uh, public art. Because as an artist, you can extend. You can put a mural out there. I mean, some people may think, "Oh, you put a painting out there on the wall." Well, a painting on the wall. In, in a public situation is not necessarily a mural that could be embraced by the community. What you want to do is you need to share, it's the idea of sharing a narrative. And uh, so it's a composition that has a narrative. And um, this, this, well, it took on a petroglyphic look, but in reality, if you're going to take a basic drawing course, you're going to start with gesture drawing, just capturing poses with the energy of the pose. And, uh, you know, you can do with quick scribbles, but you always end up with a training, formal training with stick figures, which fits a lot with the petroglyphic kind of line of drawing. So um, basically the first one was, uh, I have that one, uh, Mini Wikoni, which is like, it's a word for water is life, and Awa is Vida, water is life. But it's more of a harmonious kind of uh, narrative where you see the creative spirit, the uh, heavenly creator, <clears throat> and the essence of prayer with the community, and uh, the, all that the community does in collaboration. The second image was really directly out of what I was watching with uh, 
uh, sanding rock. And so you see the, the confrontation with the wall. And uh, actually, if you look at the wall closely, you're going to see wall literally spelled upside down, W-A-L-L. But um, yeah, the confrontation that was there, and yet at the same time, a sense of unification that was global, which was very impressive. I mean, indigenous people, first nation people coming from all over to the Standing Rock in support of what was going on there. And um, the symbolism too. Um, if you look, there's, there's a lot of interaction among the different figures that are there. But the one that I want to point out, is, which is symbolic with the Nahuatl tradition of the codices, which is uh, the books, the pictographic books from Central, uh, pre Columbian Central, uh, Central America. The images were partly depicting certain, certain actions or certain events, but there were also symbolic images. And one of the images that was used a lot in, in the codices was a serpent that was pierced by the, uh, by the arrow from the sun. And that signifies drought. But uh, so drought is something that's, um, well, this is a, an arid land. We have it's an arid altiplano, <clears throat> and we have a tradition with the acequias, and the tradition that preceded the Spanish acequias of, of sharing water in the community so that everyone can grow and feed their families. So um, basically, that's part of the imagery that I have on here. And um, I know with images, I can talk about mural images, but basically once you create an image, um, you, have, you let it go for, for a public work of art, create the image and hopefully are open to interaction with the public that is viewing the image so that the image begins to have input from the community while you're painting it. And so it flows, it changes, it goes through changes with the, <clears throat> with the input, which creates an ownership of, uh, of uh, a mural. And so, you let it go because it's going to take on a life of its own. So um, these are canvases, they're not murals, but it's kind of in that tradition of the liter visual literacy of what a mural can be. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate you sharing that with everyone here. And um, yeah, and, and when you said it has a life of its own, that, that's kind of been the central theme for this exhibition too, is that it's really, taking on a life of its own and I kind of still feel like it's doing it but you know each week there's something new um, to learn about what everyone's contributed here and you know each week there's new dialogue that's coming up um, through the exhibition um, and so yeah so we're going to learn a lot more about Dora's work now um, and so to start um, this is a really interesting image. This is a, a palette, this um, Earth Tones palette that you've continued to work with um, throughout your uh, more recent works with the dirt paintings and the burned paintings. Um, would you like to tell us how you started with this? Um, uh, yes, this this piece is, these pieces are in chronological order as far as the advancement of the work that I'm doing now. Uh, I decided to start abandoning traditional art materials and uh, such as brushes and just start trying to uh, affect the canvas as I could it, with other materials like rags and, and sandpaper and, and different ways of building a painting. You'll be surprised to learn that this is only two colors, red and blue. So wow. there's really no, as, as the layers of paint would build up, it would become darker and darker and then proceeding in a sculptural method mm -hmm. um, the image would evolve or from the canvas itself mm -hmm. wow and i think it's also really interesting to you you've continued on with the a verticality you seem to really yeah. like the, the format um but then i'm looking forward to hearing more about your process with you're kind of doing both at once where you're you're looking at the horizontal and vertical kind of simultaneously. Um, would you like to tell us about this work? Uh, this again is figurative and these were done prior to moving to or relocating to Taos and the work was more internal, it was more figurative and again this is the erosion of the surface. It, it's red and blue layer after layer after layer and uh, using lots of, um, of turpentine, resins, that will create this. So every time I layered on paint, I would have to take it off. It's kind of like beating your head against the wall. But <laughs> sooner or later, 
you have a form that will emerge. <laughs> and um, can you also tell us about the no brushes uh, part of your note here? Um, so I was I was trained in very traditional manner of painting, a, a Renaissance style uh, of painting, traditional um, palette layout, exactly like the like the Renaissance painters did. And I decided I once I got to a certain stage, I decided that I wanted to try to venture into another method of creating a painting without those tools. Um, so that's how this this thought process came about. Thank you so much. And uh, so here's another slide from you. So it seems like here you're possibly even implying fire and, and possibly even approaching uh, even where you've gone with some of your explosion paintings. Um, can you tell us about Yeah, it? at this stage, um, I, was, I was struggling over which direction to go. And I wanted to uh, try to work in, in some other really contemporary methods. So the substrate in this is a, a um, material called DuraClear. It's, it, so I wanted to create something. So I did a watercolor first and I wanted to try to work with a, a painting that would explore the possibility of light playing on another surface that's identical. <laughs> and uh, so this is the final result. This one is just part of the circle series. They were based on lunar forms or solar forms, and they were all circles. And uh, this one is kind of interesting because it looks very much like an X-ray of a heart. Mm -hmm. So these are just done with inks on paper and then photographed and then put onto the DuraClear. Then that was put on top of the, of the original painting. Mm -hmm. So you definitely have a history of experimenting with materials. It's it's all about experimentation. The whole work, the whole body of work, life in itself is guided by experimentation uh, and the process of questions of why and what if. I'm going, what do I do now? How can I change this? What can I do that will create something different? And my whole um, work has been uh, on the idea that a work cannot fail. If whatever the experiment is, it succeeds, whether it's on advancing my own, you know, intellect or the way I'm, the direction I'm going. So there's a lot, lot, of, lot of stuff you won't see, uh, but uh, it's all part of the end result. Yeah, yeah definitely the journey is at the, the center of your work and also this exhibition. See, that's a common thread with everybody. Um, and so this next work, I'm definitely recognizing um, some of these more cloud um, forms that you are continuing to work with. Correct. Uh, this piece was done in response to um, my, I hate to say this, political views, but uh, this one is breaking the peace. And this was uh, part of the ink. I had been studying Chinese ink work for, uh, I think I spent like 10 years studying how to make marks with Chinese brushes and Chinese ink and watching it explode on, on paper. And the reality is I'm not Chinese. You know, I'm never going to have that same experience. I wanted to bring it into my Western view. So I started doing this type of image and then that later evolved into block paintings. Let's see the next slide. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, yeah, this, yes, you're definitely exploring this texture even further here, a lot of nuance and kind of expanding the palette, it looks like. If you could tell us about this one. Uh, that is, is called the Black Moon. Wow. And this is a, the, the, this is one case where the image was simplified in order to explore a process. Since I consider the process to be ultimately the artwork. Uh, so this is done with ink on a, on a ground that's a penetrable ground on canvas and then completely coated with graphite, which then results, you can't see it so much in this, but it results in a changing or a shifting of your view of the surface. So the idea was how can I do these things without going into a really high tech matter? How can I use really old materials and affect something 
that shifts in front of you. So as you move across it, you'll have a totally different view of the painting. Okay, and then so here we're getting into the, the precipitation part of your work, um, and this is really exciting to see how these forms um, continue to carry on in the dirt driven by rain uh, and snow paintings that you're making. Yeah, so I, I moved to Taos and um, I didn't have a studio here at that time, so I'm thinking, now, you know, what am I going to do? I'm certainly not going to abandon my practice. And, and, uh, and I was trying to figure out how I could make marks without making art marks. What can I do to really make work? And how can I use the land and the elements themselves? For example, if I, I would walk down a cut in the, in the road and watch the rain, watch the erosion, and try to figure out how I could capture that moment, that instant, when this erosion happened. So this is this slide shows a painting that was covered in snow. So it had laid out there overnight and the rain turns to snow. Wow. So that's how the piece gets anchored with rocks. As you can see in the second slide, the rocks hold it in place, it wrinkles, the paper moves, and then after the event happens, I drag it into the studio, dry it, and uh, see what's there. And I think that's a great way that you explain that and also thinking about all of the works as these documents of events. And I think that's just really fascinating that you're able to do it in this collaboration with the place in which you live. It's totally, I, I did a show once called In Concert with Nature. And uh, I feel that, like it changes so fast that to even capture one second of that change with the knowledge that even if I just did the same thing on this one place over and over and over again, it would be a different painting. And I really refer to a, a quote by, I believe it's called Heraclitus, the Greek poet, who said that uh, you can never step in the same river twice since the river, river is not the same and you are not the same person. It all changes. And to, to feel like I can capture that instance. And in reality, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine after I'd done something that I couldn't figure out whether it was a direction to go in or not. It was part of the wind joint. And he said, it's not about the success of the work, whether it's good or bad. It's about the journey to that work. Um, so I, I always considered that to be a really profound uh, view of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, this piece up on the, on the screen right now, this is interesting. The one dirt painting was also, I tapped into a layer of charcoal that was probably about three feet under the surface of the cut mm -hmm. and it ran completely along the drive. So the reality was there that at some time in history, the land had burned and that what was left was this layer of charcoal. So I was able to actually do a, a what I call a real charcoal drawing <laughs> out of the land that, itself. So that's a lot of charcoal in that one. The second painting there is a mud puddle. So the, uh, the paper was anchored into an existing mud puddle. And as it dried, they, it just produced these wonderful, wonderful water flows to, up to the point where it dried. Well, thank you so much. And we've got a few more examples um, from your, your early days with this collaboration uh, with the land. So a few different formats here, if you'd like to tell us about these. Uh, yeah, these are just different um, variations of the same type of thing where I've anchored um, the thin one is in a gutter you know, a, a, a drainage. And I'm gonna start working on a series called uh, Ribbons, Ribbons of Dirt. And because those remind me of ribbon flows. The second one is so reminiscent of a tree form. And it just occurred. I, I don't handle these. Once the paper's put down, I don't touch it. I really don't look at it until the event of rain or snow is over. 
and then I go back and uh, look at what is left. Uh, the other two are smaller works, but the same thing. Those I experimented with using a little bit of color just dripped into some of the water while it was wet. Um, I ultimately decided that's not the direction that really wasn't true to my original premise. Uh, but yeah, definitely important to explore and just try and see. Um, and so these are really fascinating too, uh, just with looking at working with wind and seeing, and especially here, we're experiencing that today, quite a windy day too. So um, I think it's really fitting to talk about these as well. Yeah, and of course, but one of the major elements here, when it's not raining, it's windy. <laughs> and that created a series of paintings that were done with graphite dispersed into the wind mm -hmm. and captured onto simply a canvas that had been sprayed with spray glue. None of this is high tech. Um, so I created some really interesting patterns and it was directions of wind. The second, um, the black and white one, the wind was blowing in four different directions. And, you know, I changed the quadrant of the, of the um, canvas and allowed the wind to disperse in those four different things. The first piece is pollen. And coincidentally, I was out this morning, and it's probably one of the reasons I'm so raspy. I was capturing a, a lot of uh, the wind to affect pollen onto a surface. And the pollen I collected early in the spring by just going out every morning at the same time of day when it would dry on the candle of the, of the pinyon tree and just tap it and collect the pollen. Again, it's hard to say, but for me, a lot of the painting, that's it. That was, it's the process. It's the, it's going from that stage to dispersing it onto the canvas. And it, it will give a replica of the image of being pollen dispersed against the blue sky. But that's what I see when I see the, the pollen coming off. Unfortunately, there are side effects to pollen. Yes. pollen. <laughs> <laughs> the last one is. Um, Sorry, go I'll back go to back. The other yeah. One. Yeah, it's a, a part of a hive of a ball. Is it called a white faced wasp? Mm -hmm. wow. And I had it, but rather than taking it and using pieces of it, I just used it onto a surface like the burn paintings here. And so there's beautiful images, there's beautiful parts of the eggs in the hive. And this is after it was taken down, it was no longer in use. And the paper, it is paper, is black and white. And I thought how appropriate that it goes with my work. And so the next image that we're looking at, this Ukraine image, um, this looks like your bridge into the, the burn paintings. Can you tell us about this one? Uh, this piece was done. I, I had this, this canvas that laid out for about a year, accumulating all different kinds of residue and, uh, and uh, remains of dirt and rock and all kinds of stuff on it. And I brought it in. I'm going, what am I going to do now? And unfortunately, I was watching television the night that the first bomb was dropped on Ukraine. Mm. And when I saw that black just going across the surface, it was a potent image. And so I used that, but also gave homage to Ukraine with the sunflowers, that I believe the sunflowers will return. Thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, that, that definitely speaks to some of the other works that you've made, um, some with ink, and then also um, one of the bird paintings that we have here. Um, so both of these works are here in the exhibition currently. Um, can you tell us a little more detail about both of these? Uh, the, the bird painting, not everything looks successful. Probably 50% really don't work, or for some reason. Now, I could just stand up here and say, yes, they all, because they are what they are. <laughs> um, however, they don't satisfy that need that I have for a successful or artifact left over after the event. Mm -hmm. So I take them, tear them up into pieces, put them in a garbage can, and burn them. Simple as that. 
and it creates a beautiful, beautiful um, surface on the paper. And then I just reassemble those surfaces into a what I hope is cohesive. The second one is an ink painting that was done based on the description of the Icelandic volcano that happened. And there's some uh, passages in there that really give homage to the traditional Asian way of working. It's on there. This one again is on rice paper using ink backwashed with an ink, with a different synchromatic ink. And it is fugitive, so it changes. Thank you so much. Um, and these are two more works that we have here um, in the galleries. And you know, I think just hearing more about your process and you know bringing the paper out outside your studio and then bringing it back in. Um, I did want to call attention to um, the dirt painting on the left, um, where you, on all of your dirt paintings, that you inscribe um, the degrees and then also the place. Can you tell us about um, that aspect of the process? Absolutely. So once this is done, um, well, actually before, I take and I, look, and I use my cell phone, thank goodness for iPhone, <laughs> and I get the longitude and latitude, the, the place that this is laid. So I record that in pencil. That's the title of the piece. So that anytime someone wants to know where this was out on the land, you just punch in those coordinates and there it is. Uh, I try not to clean these up now. And you can see the rocks in this. You can see where the rocks anchored it and the water and dirt flowed over the paper. I use a very heavy watercolor paper in large rows. The second one is called the Great Dime. So in working with the land and working with the earth and the reality of our impact on this planet, I hope that everybody takes time to really look around and see because we've, we have had, I believe it's four total extinctions. <laughs> And so this one was based on my readings of the extinctions. And, and uh, this, the great dime, not even the insects were left. So I find that this is somehow, with my readings of Navajo, or not Navajo, but of Native America, all have a, a tradition of stories that relate to the Earth's extinction and the coming of it. And this work too, uh, you can uh, if we could go back to yeah. um, that bird painting. Um, that you know we can really see some of the different insects. The way that you've composed this painting, um, that you've made it so that it appears that most of the insects are right towards the center of this composition. Um, and so I think that's a really important entry point, you know, just in, in terms of calling attention and then kind of seeing, you know, what's going, what's the context around it. Um, can you talk a little bit about your, your placement of some of the elements of this? Uh, this one was just a, a canvas that I, I burned. And uh, actually, no, this one, the one I, I filmed the fire that was burning it. Uh, but this one, there are, are dead insects that I've tried to place in it just wherever I felt like they were they were needed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it almost, you know, it gives you sort of a rose-like form on this particular work. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting too that uh, with this work that it also has some correlation to some other artworks in the exhibition and we have another one uh, by Pola Lopez that also features the insects too. So I think it's really important that uh, this group of artists you all are thinking about some themes that cross over. You're, you're thinking about these different layers of existence, you know, in this place and also um, you know, chapters of change, these different, these different epics of the land in which we live. Absolutely, that's very important to me. And it's important that, that if I can just impress on anybody to take the time to look at the land around you, the, the colors, they're not profound colors, but they're, they're earthy and they're, they're tactile. And uh, these, even though they're sprayed, I don't put glass over them so that you could actually touch the work and feel it. And when I first started using the dirt, I was thinking this is this is so much like the um, the original people 
that painted in cave paintings in Lascaux and Altamira, Spain, and, and that they used the same material. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that was pretty important to me to find something that's, that conveys that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the wind drawings were interesting because I also took objects like a big clump of horsehair, strung it on a string from a tree and let the wind blow the actual lines on the paper. So there's all these different kinds of, of ways to affect and make art without using, you know, expensive art materials. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah, so in that way you end up with your own brush, yeah. like you're making this brush that works um, with yeah, the and I don't, I don't, I don't uh, work on the, uh, the actual drawing. I just let it execute itself, making the marks of the wind, because you can you can't see the wind, you can see the effect, you can see the leaves, but you can't really see the wind. So by doing this, it allows me to watch exactly the direction of the wind and the way it makes circular motions by swinging the brush swinging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that also really correlates to the different things you've been talking about like documenting these events docu documenting that one moment where you know those were horse hairs they're moving with the wind they're touching your paper and then you know that's yeah. documentation of like a particular day and um absolutely just the Third reflection time. on that exactly so there's one more slide uh, for you uh, just a couple of paintings if you'd like to speak about these oh well i suppose you might consider them just portraits of horses. These were after COVID, and I was doing a lot of research um, on the fall of the Roman Empire, and uh, also in its correlation with the book of Revelations. So these are based on the four horses, not the four horsemen, the colors of the four horses, and how these colors have certain connotations in, uh, in the world. And again, these, and, I, and probably ever so often I need to redefine that I don't just depend on things flowing or not touching anything, that I'm capable of, of producing something that's a little different. And these were done without brushes, only with rags and Q-tips and things like that, um, exacto knives that to create the images. So there's four in this series the white, the black, the red, and the pale, which is ultimately death. So I hate to, for you to, to end this you thinking that I'm a morbid person. I'm not. I just think it's very interesting that we have so many things going on that relate to history. And if we're not students of history, we're doomed to re, you know, repeat the same, same mistake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if we could go back to the beginning of the slideshow and um, if we wanted to look, let's look at slide number four um, with the Simolero shirt. Thank you. Um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. And um, so Juanita, I was wondering if you could tell us about where you're headed with the future of your work and are there things about this series that speak to what you're you know, thinking about now? <coughs> um, this installation was sponsored by uh, Art Lab and 216 Arts. <coughs> it was a sponsorship and uh, support for realizing it. But it was an idea that happened a long time ago. And um, it was an idea that I wanted to relate the story that maybe a lot of people weren't aware of. And uh, so my hope for this is to, um, it's going to be a transition. Um, the uh, shirts make it difficult to take it 
to different places. I was asked, who is my main audience? And I will tell you, my main audience is the community, the casinos of my ancestral communities here in northern New Mexico. My intent in creating this whole installation that relates to the shirts and the ciboleros and the comancheros, something that I can throw into my car. <clears throat> I can take it anywhere, I can assemble it, I can install it, I can show it, I can talk about it, I can pack it and take it home without too many, too many uh, issues. But the shirts create a problem. You know, I talked about the hours and hours that went into the, the hand spun shirt. <clears throat> I can't leave that overnight in a, in a location. So um, actually I'm applying for a grant to have these shirts both digitally captured and have the images put on two screen, a laminated canvas I can take and hang up <clears throat> so that all of these pieces can be taken. And I have, I have um, Castilla, Omasapa, I mean, I have all different uh, communities here where the lunch, the senior citizen lunch programs are interested in having something like this to be installed and to generate <clears throat> talk with a lot of the uh, ancianos that are there. And it's interesting because um, Oftentimes, when uh, some of these images are there, based on the research that I've done over time, I'll get someone who come up who comes up to me to talk about familiarity. Like I was there, <laughs> you know, these are things that have been, you know, years, generations past. But um, it it does generate a conversation among the seniors, but also too, uh, I am very much focused with you working with youth, and I think that youth need to hear the story of the connection. Like this Cibolero shirt, this particular shirt <clears throat> that um, is the historical prototype of what they like to wear, just hanging around, you know, just with the chono shirts. But um, I intend to be taking this, um, and I have um, communities that are scheduled. So the next year, um, this installation should be making the rounds for short, short presentations, but enough so that people can see this and hopefully make some stimulate some memories that they personal memories that they have <clears throat> and they can share within their families and um, it's also part of collaborative work and as a classroom teacher i'm used to working with people i'm used to relating very much with that <clears throat> having the back and forth with my audience and uh i i just see collaborations happen. I just finished a collaboration this past month with the Paseo Project mm -hmm. with storytelling mm -hmm. and with uh, quick draw, quick draw images. Um, and uh, this is something I intend to continue pursuing. I will continue with my own personal work in my studio, but my main work really is uh, collaborative and communal. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Thank you so much for sharing. We'll definitely keep an eye out um, for more of your installations and keep us posted on, on where we can see uh, the new versions of the, the shirts. Um, and then I was also wondering if we could um, go back to the end of the slideshow, um, say, um, you know, let's go to slide 18. Great. And um, Dora, same question for you. Can you tell us about your work that you mentioned a little while ago? What, what's, what are you thinking about for the future of your practice? Where are you headed? Um, that's a good question. And I ask myself every day. And I also ask myself, oh, sorry. I also ask myself, okay, what if I did this? What if I tried something else? Um, and I think that's the whole deal. But I need to constantly be exploring and experimenting. And uh, that's what I'm about. So regardless of the outcome of the piece, I've got to continue changing. And uh, the ex exploration, I hope, doesn't end. Um, I don't believe I've got sufficiently bored with the dirt paintings yet. <laughs> so I think <laughs> that's one of the things. If I become so desensitized to what I'm doing, and it fails to give me that, ah, you know, that aha moment, um, 
then I just, I find a new direction, something different that challenges me. It's always got to challenge me. And that's, so I can't really tell you. Uh, other than this morning, I was doing another pilot painting, and, uh, and again, I got excited about that because I had gathered the pollen, and it was really windy, and then it wasn't, and it rained, and so I have to, I depend a lot on the elements and what the land gives me, so that's, that's where I am right now. Thank you so much, and does anyone have questions for the artists? Uh, for Dora, the the bird painting is shiny. It what is makes shiny. it shiny? It's very simply bear thing. Even though I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Even though I use um, a matte bear thing, the build up in order to make the paper really rigid enough to stand up without having a case on it. Uh, it ends up with a shiny surface, but it's fair thing, floor finish. And do you do you coat the dirt paintings afterwards to keep the dirt to I, I stabilize them, it? Yes, I give them a really probably two can full cans of a fixative, um, and it varies from, from different things. I, I experimented with several of them to begin with, and to see which ones, and I'll test to see if it's holding up. But the fix, it's not unlike what you would do to a pastel painting. Mm -hmm. The same type of measures you would take to make one of those hold up. The spray it. Um, uh, uh, Mrs. Lavin, I uh, was very intrigued by the symbolism that you put in your uh, small mural paintings, especially the arrow coming going through the uh, serpent to indicate drought. Those are just wonderful myths uh, that are symbolic in a way, as, as the Chimayo painters use the snake symbolism. I forget the name of that particular symbol that is so prevalent uh, in their pottery. And I think it's the yes. Uh, just uh, do you have any other works that uh, uh, elucidate more of those types of symbols that you seem so aware of? Uh, where, what would you recommend? Look at those. I think the best example that I can give you right now, as I speak here in Taos, would be the uh, El Prado Lucasstorm mural that was done in 1978 with Enriqueta Vasquez. <clears throat> and it's, I don't know if you're familiar with it, when you're driving into Taos, there's that big red cup, there's a Taos cup, and there's a liquor store there, the mural, that's the mural I'm talking about. And there's a lot of symbolism in there, we have a lot of fun playing with it, but there's two circles. <clears throat> there's the night circle with the moon, and then the circle with the day vision going on. If you look at the night symbol, um, you improvise the symbolism. And this is where, if you're going to work with a mural, it's really critical to have interaction with the public that's going to be living with it. And um, the second time, the third time that we painted, there's a story about the evolution of that particular mural. But um, the wall was destroyed and it's insurance covered, replastering, restructuring the wall, replastering it so we had to start from scratch. But at that time that we were working in the mural was when federal government was planning on doing flyovers mm -hmm. with their military aircraft. Mm -hmm. And so we had those particular aircraft, I can't remember the numbers, you know, they have the numbers in their names, but they're up there. Um, another, another way of using symbolism is in the circle, in the original mural, we had a white buffalo symbolizing the hope and spiritual, spiritual strength. <clears throat> Uh, and also the spiritual strength that the earth gives us. But um, we had somebody coming in, and uh, uh, this is what I like about the, the, uh, the ownership of the communities. Oh, that mural has been up there all my life. I'm glad you're repainting it. But this particular young man came up and he says, I come here all the time when I'm going to go hunting. Which <laughs> makes me a question. But his comment was, How come you don't have an elk in there? And said, so, Okay. So the original white buffalo that was in that circle of day at daytime changed to an elk and the buffalo robe that was the shaman 
And that was Enriqueta's specialty. She put all these buffalo in there, and in there now is the white buffalo. If you wanted the elk, and that was part of his story, which is there's not, well, okay, this is part of what goes into it, the symbolism. It, it changes, but it changes with the awareness of what people can recognize. I mean, it's a universal symbol when you're driving, you see a fork and a fork and knife and a, and a spoon. You know, uh, as a visual literacy, that's going to tell you there's some place to eat. So there's there's a lot of ways of playing with liter with uh, visual literacy. So you have a narrative, and the paintings that I do are kind of allegorical. These were less oracle than my usual paintings, except for the Earth, not the Earth. That was an accident. The Valentine you see there was an accident. It wasn't intended. But the face of the that's in there, the the whiskey face with the uh, that's blowing the air as a prayer. But um, a narrative in a mural, uh, it can be, you can put personal narratives in there, but also has to have some kind of a recognized meaning. So in this particular mural that you're asking about, I know there's a scorpion and there's a dog that's barking and people that are <clears throat> with their, uh, their munitions shooting across and the fence. Let me just jump in. Can you switch to slide seven, please? Thanks. But uh, the symbol of the drought that I put in there is not something that's familiar here. So when I talk about it, I do have to point out that that is a symbol of drought, which we are facing, climate change. It's a symbol of climate change. So um, I think some symbols may have their merit in a historical sense that may have lost their meaning. But I think as they are brought up into conversation, they may have a transition. And then another example is the Buffalo Platte. You know, people may think, oh, it's just plat. Yeah, but there's a story to that. And it's a story that pertains to our culture here in northern New Mexico that I'd like to share. So as a muralist or as an artist, I try to convey this, that I also might have to explain a little bit. It's not all the symbols are, are automatically clear. I hope that answers your question. Oh, well, thank you so much for sure. elucidating that. And I think that uh, symbolism really conveys almost the myths of culture that really carry on. And I feel that we've really lost so much of that in this culture at this time because we're so saturated with imagery now, but we don't really have the texture, the depth of knowledge of hangs up, that hangs out in the back of our minds that we may not even be aware of. I think for me, the, um, for my experiences, something that really had an influence on me uh, was the ecclesi ecclesiastical works. I know there's the Renaissance paintings that, you know, we've seen the cards of the little uh, the devotional cards or the images, you know, they show in the churches or what you might see at the Vatican. And also what you see with the Santero images, the collection we have back here, the rooms back here. But um, there's a lot of hidden symbolism in a lot of these classical works that many people are not aware of, unless you know the story. But, um, and then also too, the tradition of uh, Avanyu in the pottery, that has its own significance. It's some, you know, you might hear stories about it. But they, by and large, depending on the culture, sometimes the interpretation is a little bit different, but it has its merits as, as a symbol. So thank you for that question. Sure. Thank you so much uh, for everyone being here. I uh, really appreciate the conversation. I appreciate everything that you both contributed. I think so much was brought to the foreground today just in terms of these different strands of your practices, um, your backgrounds, how you guys connect as well. So thank you so much for a really excellent discussion. I appreciate it. It's over, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely want to get a photo of you guys before we, uh, before we depart. But, um, uh, well, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Can you take a photo of the three of us? Oh, sure. Uh, thank you. I think it's a good one. I'm going to put this through the little one together. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mentioned that. I wrote that down. Oh, I'm going to try it. Yeah, I'm going to try it this way.
Okay. Posture. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Jen's question was one that I asked about the finish on that piece. Oh. But like that, all that Ben Baker's so delicate. 